So Stu Leonard's Mark, I got to know what was your favorite or, or maybe least favorite animatronic, you know, the, you know, the, the garage made, I, did he make those himself in his own garage? I got to know. I don't think so. I think those, those are high quality. So, well, some of them, some of like the flipping monkey guy. Remember that? That was like oh, yeah, that was, a coffee can. Those might just be the, the actual, like the supplier, whatever company just kind of throws that in there. But there were some, the, there were good ones. The, the Dole one was really good. And Wait, that, I got to hear it. Wait, hold on. I got it. Do you, it's still in your head. You got to You got to know that tune. You know yeah, that tune? Dude, my kids and I sing it all the time and it's, it's marketing genius from their standpoint. Cause they were, it said something like dull fresh vegetables look good on you. Yeah, There's yes. actually a whole verse to it, but yeah. I love it. Welcome to the Let Me Save You 25 Year Podcast, where we break down a new shamanism each week. Each one is a lesson I've learned along the way in hopes that you can maybe learn from my mistakes and build great things even bigger, better, faster than I ever did, perhaps shaving off a decade or two, we'd hope. My book called Let Me Save You 25 Years, where today's topic comes from, is intentionally really short. So think of this as the long version of the book where we can go deeper into these shamanisms from each chapter, like the one today, work in the seams and cracks. So the story that inspired this little Shaunism, at least uh, for the book's purposes, there were many experiences that inspired the Shaunism as all of them. But uh, <clears throat> we were in the very first Love Sack location, like a few weeks in, and much to our surprise, it was working. Like we were selling stuff. Like we were just, we were hoping we'd sell stuff, but we didn't know until we did it. And in fact, the store's just bumping and the music's going and the big screen TV and people are watching movies, flopping down in sacks, having a good time. And someone walks up and is like, this is so cool. Do you guys franchise? And I see this conversation happening between my cousin, who's the only other employee at the time working in the, in the store. And I, and I, and I see him give him my card and say, Hey, call this guy. He's like the head guy. And so I run outside the store onto the bridge of the gateway mall and I answer my mobile phone, loves that corporation. And this, and this guy wants to franchise. He says, oh, yeah, uh, of course we franchise. What location are you in? He says, your Salt Lake store. Says, oh, yeah, that's a good one. Of course, it's our only store, right? And um, anyway, a few weeks later, we've got franchise documents. We're ripping. We're, Trace and I then pack up the truck uh, to open stores of our own in Las Vegas and uh, Arizona, where, where our first franchise was. We move ourselves out to California to open store, Love Sack stores out there. And for the next like two years of my life, I, I'm living in a car. I'm either opening a new store somewhere out in California or in the Western United States, or I'm uh, driving back and forth to Tijuana, where we've moved the Love Sack factory. Uh, I'm pulling a trailer full of shrunken sacks from Mexico, Tijuana, that is, through San Diego, all the way back to Salt Lake, maybe even Denver by now where we have stores a couple years in. And along the way, man, I'm building spreadsheets on the armrest of the truck, like on my laptop plugged into a, like a power inverter so I could have power. Um, you know, I've got, I've got a mobile phone in this hand and this was early for mobile phones. This is like early two thousands, right? I'm texting. I'm, I'm, and look, I'm not condoning this. It's a terrible way to drive a vehicle. You shouldn't even, you know, shouldn't even be telling you I did this. But my point is every minute of every day during that time when it was go time was on. And if I wasn't working or finding a way to, to, handle emails, respond to this, take a phone call. That's why I love driving. There's no better time to take phone calls than driving. Why? Because I always felt super relaxed. Why? Because I was being double productive. Like I'm moving myself from here to there, whatever, I, wherever it is I needed to go. And now I can talk to you for an hour, for two hours if you want, because I've got the time. I love a good road trip because it felt so productive to me. You know, now we can be even more productive in the air. We've got Wi-Fi. You know, that wasn't the case back then. But, you know, and having the discipline to crack open my laptop, even today, at this, you know, when I'm on a flight and get a little bit of work done or, or write my book or, you know, uh, generate some content or whatever it is, as opposed to just vegging out and watching a movie. Now, is there a time to veg out? Yeah, sometimes, man, we just got to unplug. And uh, if we have that option... You can also play in the seams and cracks. 
but arming myself with uh, the right adapters, the right screens, the right power sources, the extra batteries, as dumb as it sounds, charging cables of every kind uh, so that I could always be able to work in the seams and cracks in the back of an Uber. I do it today. You know, uh, I continue to work all the way until I get to the um, security line at uh, check-in when I'm on my way to the airport. There's just, and by doing that, when I, when I land back home, let's say I'm returning home, I can now be a dad. I now have a little more time to be totally engaged with my kids or my, my wife as a husband, as a partner, because I've worked in the seams and cracks, particularly, particularly when I'm alone, when I'm forced to be alone by travel, by work, by what have you use all that time. And so I'm a big advocate of this idea of working in the seams and cracks, playing in the seams and cracks. Sometimes you can go the other way, like on a work trip, like find a way to get a little bit of playing, get exercise in, you know, wake up a little earlier, though generate some cracks and seams in your life by giving that extra hour or two of early alarm clock to wake up and go do something fun. I surf uh, when I'm in California, when at the crack of dawn, I, I dirt bike when I'm in Utah at the crack of dawn. Um, and because those are times, by the way, when my kids might, e might either be not up themselves or, uh, you know, I wouldn't have a chance to interact anyway. And then when I come home from dirt biking or something, I'm able to engage with them before they take off to school or who knows what, cause I went that early and then I can work in those other giant seams and cracks. So I think like learning how to juggle our busy lives. And by the way, you know, now posting on social media, finding the moments in the back of an Uber, who knows what to generate that content, have the discipline to do it, open up the apps, get the posts out there so that you have some frequency if, if that's important. And today we're going to, um, you know, talk to someone who, uh, does exactly that as well. And has built an empire by, by, by working in the seams and cracks. So, there's, I mean, I could go on and on. There's endless tactics, but the idea is if you really want to do something, if you want to be great and it doesn't have to be entrepreneur, right? But if you want to get ahead, life is short and you got to work in every seam and crack because it's a competitive world and there's a lot to get done. I am your host for the Let Me Save You 25 Years podcast, Sean D. Nelson, founder and CEO of Lovesack. Joining me today is a business person and entrepreneur who I think well represents that rare breed of entrepreneur who has bridged the gap between more traditional bootstrap fundraise business brand building through the 90s and 2000s, like me, through today's new media slash social media, business, brand building, even leveraging oneself, one's family, even as an influencer to make it happen. A serial entrepreneur of late with foot, a footwear line, apparel, snack brand, media empire, an influencer himself, father of two beautiful and talented mega influencers, devoted husband, and from what I can tell, generally good dude. Please welcome to the pod, Mark D'Amelio. Thanks, Sean. Appreciate it, man. Thanks for having me. Yeah, great to hang out, man. Um, yeah, so much fun to discover your Norwalk roots. Norwalk, Connecticut. Big shout out to the CT, the 203. And uh, on this week's, Sean, this week's pod, we're going to be talking about my Seanism working in the seams and cracks. Because it's not just been my mantra, you know, for this book. It's been my lot in life since I started Love Sack as a side hustle in college. Uh, I've had no choice but to work in every seam and crack that life gave me. Because whether it was, you know, finishing school while running a weird be not beanbag business and waiting tables, whether it was, uh, you know, keeping up with a family of four kids and everything else going on. So, so Mark, before we, you know, I've got some specific things, but I don't know when you, when you heard this topic, work in the seams and cracks, what came to mind for you? I, I look at things as, as looking at the whole picture of business and trying to find things as much as I say, in the I've said in the past, like not try to reinvent the wheel. I do sometimes look at things and try to find unique ways to approach things. And I remember early on when I started my first clothing brand, figuring out ways to compete. And, and that's what seams and cracks means to me, like finding ways that maybe 
a bigger company or a competitor might not look at or even overlook and look at ways to 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 work within within the seams and cracks. That's what it means. That, that's what it kind of means to me. Oh, that's good. I like that. So looking for blue ocean space, looking for ways to, um, you know, have your own niche or your own segment of something, you know, that's huge, like footwear. There's a good example, right? Like you, you recently propelled yourself into the footwear business with your daughters and your family and all of your influence. Um, so how, so yeah, in that realm, how, how do you, how do you think of, uh, that idea? So I, I think initially what, what I thought about and what I've learned over my career is, is not to try to reinvent the wheel. So what we've done with the footwear brand is, is I'm not a footwear designer. I've been in the apparel space for a long time. So getting the right team around me was pivotal, like getting a guy who knows how to produce footwear, who's worked with someone who's probably going to be our competitor someday um, and, and get the right people around us. And then understand that, look, we've kind of done things as a family in a unique way and how to almost take the old school of, of, yes, you need a competent footwear designer and you need to handle the production right. You need to get all the things down that any business would do. 3PL, distribution, uh, website, all that stuff. And then look at things like, wait a sec, what have I learned over my 20 years that maybe a bigger footwear brand is not doing? How could we be unique in the space? How could we, how could we do things a little bit differently and those are things I, I always think about. And and people kind of look at me sometimes like, wait. And then I, I'll say, hear me out. And then I usually yeah. turn some <laughs> turn some opinions around. Yeah, actually on a different topic, this is something that comes up in 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 my book directly that, you know, I've always taken, I've observed and later taken great pride in the fact that um you, you know, I'm not a furniture expert. I didn't come I mean, I, I kind of am one now. But, and you know, we've been the fast growing furniture retailer for now almost a decade. So I'm in the industry, but there is a total of one person out of like my corporate staff of, let's say four or 500 people, one that comes out of furniture. And it's, it's the precisely the fact that I was dumb enough to ask questions like, well, why can't we build a couch this way? And all the furniture experts told me, you know, you can't do it that way. So I think like, frankly, finding those seams and cracks in an industry and a way to compete is easier when you're dumb enough to say, why not? Because like, you don't know any better, right? Like sometimes the experts know too much. It's like, well, we don't, you know, that's just not the way it's done. I, I think, and again, I know uh, people may know, I don't know how we got connected, but I am a lo- love sack consumer. So, and one well. of the things I look at is, you know how many times I've tried to get two pieces of a couch to stick together yep. and not slide through the middle <laughs> and your product. And I know this, uh, I, I know you don't want this to be a commercial for your product. And, no, it's and, great. But commercial away. <laughs> it's amazing, right? I don't know. And again, I don't know any of the, uh, any of the lingo, but the fact that I've actually had to lift the couch up and screw them together, which probably destroyed the, the couch of yeah. other people's products. And your product has those little, the, yeah. the squares that shoes, the They're shoes. Called shoes. How do you like that? I mean, and that to me, I was like, wait, why, why isn't every couch have these, these things? And there's some sort of, with other couches, there's some sort of mechanism that kind of clicks it together and then it inevitably falls apart. They break and they're terrible. Yeah. I I sometimes joke if, if all we had done was make a sectional that didn't slide apart, we won. Yeah. But of course, and you know, what's cool is I didn't even know you were a customer to be really honest. That's, that's really flattering and really cool. Thank you. Oh, we have, a, we have, I mean, all of our videos, we have a huge love sack in, in our, in our movie room. And we, and it actually, what, what happens is, and Heidi and I say this all the time, we end up like falling asleep on the couch yeah. and not in our bed. And we're like, love sack. Awesome. That's so cool, man. Yeah, that's, man, that's really humbling. That's, that's, that's amazing. And by the way, I'm sure that uh, very soon I'll be one way or another, a consumer of, uh, D'Amelio footwear because my wife, so, so funny fact, I've sourced footwear in China. I know everything there is to know about shoe lasts and manufacturing and all of it because my wife was in the shoe business first as a retailer. She ran a shoe boutique called pears, like the fruit in, in Salt Lake back in the day. 
And then later parlayed that into a shoe line that she was kind of co-founded with a friend um, who's now run with it. That she, My wife's out because we had our fourth child and just couldn't do it. But her friend has continued with uh, Cecilia, New York and been really successful. And so um, I helped them source over in Asia back in the day and got them kind of started over there and and uh, know more than I ever want to know, both on that end and just, be, you know, besides the fact I'm crammed into like two square feet of our closet well, my wife is the other, you know, 50 and yeah. mostly footwear. So, so I'm sure we'll be customers very soon. <laughs> people, people think like, and one of the reasons why we started D'Amelio Brands is, is I, I wanted to do things that we really did from the beginning and really from the inception, not just put our name on it, like really get involved in the design process. Cool. And yeah, we don't own the factories overseas but we're in touch with them. We, 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 we make every decision on it. And people, I, I know if you, when you read the comments, you're like, Oh, this is just another, this is just another thing to make money. Or they probably just did a licensing deal. We do everything. The next cool. room behind me is a showroom. And we have, we actually have our, our head designers based in Connecticut and the, the, Connecticut is a hotbed for shoe, for shoe people, because there's, there's a bunch of companies in New York and then, there's uh, nine West, I think is in Westchester somewhere. So there's a lot of, a lot of shoe people in Connecticut. So we do it all. And I've learned, yeah. I've learned more than I think I need to know about women's footwear. Yeah. You know, what's funny is I met the, who not be named an executive from nine West in a karaoke joint in Asia that, that informed me nine West was nine West broad street, which is right down from love sack headquarters. It's so random, you know, so it's Connecticut, it's got all kinds of weird <laughs> businesses uh based there that you'd never know so right. footwear cool well uh so back to our topic du jour work in the seams and cracks where this came from in the book is i could never possibly find the time to raise a family you know be a be a hopefully good dad and then not not just a father but you know a, try to be a real family person uh be into music like i am outdoors, dirt bike, all the things I do without learning to work in every seam and every crack. So in my case, I share this story in the book where I'm, this is terrible, by the way, I do not condone this, but I'm, I'm driving across the country back and forth all the time, pulling trailers full of sacks. This is in the earliest days. I used to deliver them myself to the showrooms. You had franchises, all this stuff. And I'm pulling this trailer load of sacks. And on the, on the armrest, I have my laptop plugged into a power inverter so I can do spreadsheets for our orders in Asia. Cause I, you know, th there's just no time. And today more than ever, you know, with our, with our phones, with our laptops, with all the devices, you know, wireless, even, even recording like this, you can do from anywhere. So I'm curious, like how does someone like you that has every iron in the fire, your footwear line, you now your snack line, whatever's going on there. Obviously your daughter's together with your own social media. I don't know how you got, what is it? A million five now on Instagram? Like, what the heck? Like, that's insane. Right. For, for, for a person that's listen for your, it's one thing for your daughters who are of the generation, but, um, it's amazing what you've done on social media. How do you keep up with it all? How do you work in the seams and cracks, Mark? What are some of your secrets to cramming it all in? And, and, you know, do you have any, even tactical secrets that you use to keep up with, with the demands? Yeah. I mean, I, I find it interesting that my company is very young. We have a lot of young people and I'm, I, I guess I'm generation X and you, you would think <laughs> that I wouldn't use technology the way some of the other people in the company do. And we, again, we have a really young company and sometimes people will come in my office with a problem uh, without a solution. So I, I always say, look, if you, if there, there's, there's going to be problems and you don't have the best solution, but at least come up with something and I think one of the things that I've been able to do is really use YouTube and use TikTok to find technology. And, and, and I'm, 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 I'm a sponge when it comes to trying to save some time because I don't want to spend 16 hours a day working. I want to enjoy my life at, at my age. And, but I am pulled in a million different directions. So figuring out ways to do things, I'm, I use, uh, Siri then and to make to make to do lists and I I track them in things and I and I delegate those to other people and then I work so I'm always trying to find Wait. ways to shave time 
off of what would take an hour, get it down to 10 minutes. And then, then I could either be productive with those. No, this is good. I want, I want some of these secrets. So, so things is an app. I don't even know things. What is that? Tell me, tell us, yeah, tell us about it. Like, yeah. And I'm not an, I'm not an endorser of things. So I'll go into, I'll go into Siri and I'll say when I'm, when I'm driving or whatever, and I'll say, Hey Siri, remind me to talk about the Shopify list or whatever and it Siri was just pulling up and then it'll actually convert into things and then I could tag things to if it's something I need to talk about accounting and finance with I'll just click the accounting and finance button so then when I come to my meeting with our finance team I have five or six things that I've worked over the last few last week or so and I'm not fishing around going, wait, what did I want to talk to you about again? Or or looking in five different places to get some notes. And my right. wife looks at me sometimes like, wait, what are you, why are you always telling Siri to, to, to do something? But it, it works for me. And it, it makes it when someone needs to say, when, they're, when they come in my office and say, hey, Mark, I just need five minutes. It's not only one way where I'm like, wait, I also need five minutes back to you. And these are the things that I have on my list. So, wow. Um, that's brilliant. That's yeah. that's perfect. I mean, that's the kind of uh, useful stuff I I think is totally relevant to this idea of working in the seams and cracks. Because when you, if it's not just a normal office job, and I don't think there is one anymore today. Like you know, even if you, for instance, people that work at Lovesack, they're busy people. So like, even if they have a little bit more of a call it and think of it like a nine to five than I do, as I don't know, some entrepreneur founder guy they've got kids to keep track of. They got dance rehearsals to get to. They've got, you know, the real life they're juggling as well as their, their day job, their career, et cetera. And just staying organized. Uh, that's really useful. Any, any other really just down to earth tips and tricks? That's a good one. So the things app has been useful to you leveraging Siri. I like that. Anything, anything else come to mind? How do you, how does Mark D'Amelio work in the seams and cracks? I, I think one of the big things for me with, with someone who it, I have I have terrible OCD, which sometimes works in my to my benefit and sometimes cripples me in, in ways that I have to have my desk set and all these things. And, and I've mm-hmm. learned when I come up with this full list, if I have 20 things for the week or 30 things for the week, how do I delegate those? And what's your ones that I'm like, hey, these are I've told my kids all the time uh, I, and I've had to learn to go back on this a little bit. I've always said, pack, pack your own parachute. And I forgot who told me that, but, but that has grown into pack your own parachute for things that when you're jumping on a plane, meaning something that's critical, if you're going to do something that is critical, you might want to look, make sure you have your eyes on it, hands on it, pack your own parachute. But I so have give me, learned. Give me a specific example of that. Like for real out of your life. Like what, like, give me an example. Like what, when have you packed your own parachute lately? I, I think something that really is is brand focused, something that could be if it goes wrong to be that could be catastrophic. You know, I, again, like a contract, for example, we have lawyers that look at this stuff. Some when it's when it's a boilerplate and and I trust my lawyer and then sometimes I'll look at it and real not sometimes if it's critical and I'm getting in a long term contract that has. Yeah financial implications, I will read through the whole thing and say, Hey, I noticed this. And and sometimes yeah. just with my experience, I'll catch something that yeah. they'll say, Oh yeah, that's, and I'm like, okay. So, um, no, I, I, look, I think, I think both of those statements are valuable. You know, you, frankly, you may not have the time to read every line of every contract, sometimes not even at all. And you need to know when to trust and when, you know, it's lower stakes and you can just sign because the people you've hired to represent you tell you you can sign. And when they've told you the same thing about something you deem to be more pivotal, you're digging in and reading maybe every line. Yeah. And uh, but using that judgment allows you to right work in the seams and cracks, because if you had to read every line of every contract just because you're OCD. Yeah. Now you're too busy reading contracts and you're missing something else. Yes. And I think delegating is, as I've always been very entrepreneurial, I've always kind of done things on my own and, and trusting other people to do those things has been, has been very helpful. So when I look at that list and I, and I say, oh, this is something that is more operational, but we should give, hand this off to our head of operations. 
I have to be comfortable to, to, to delegate that. And this way I just get my list down of things. All right, this week, these are the four or five things that I need to accomplish aside from the pro the meetings and all the other things that we have going on. This is what I want to accomplish this week. This is what I think other people could, could accomplish. And then I've, I've just added something else on top of that. I think when you're the CEO and sometimes people, there's a little bit of an intimidation factor and they're, and they just say, yes, yes, yes. And I stop everybody. And I'm just, I'm like, look, this is your time to, I'm delegating something to you. This is your time to, to, to ask questions and to really dig in on what I, what I want out of this. And it saves me time later to go back and, and say, Oh, well, that's not really what I wanted. And I think the onus is on me also to, to make sure what we're trying to accomplish is clear from, 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 from my, from my end. And I think that helps the people who are trying to, to, to help me, uh, complete a, complete a task or, or a project or whatever it may be. That's good. So not just delegating only, which is of course, uh, a high level behavior that it can allow you to get more done working in the seams and cracks, but also, uh, delegating efficiently by giving the proper amount of face time to the people you've asked to do things for you on your behalf. So you're not just blowing stuff up in the end. I, I look, I do it all the time. It's like, man, you should have shown me this product sooner because now I'm just going to blow it up because right. I hate the hardware or whatever it is. And my team hates it. And I'm trying to coach them, like, come get me, grab yeah. me by the neck and shake me and say, look at this, Sean, because if you wait to the end, I'm probably just going to blow the thing up. And then we're, you know, we're behind on the timeline. And so, and I think that's what happens. I think there's a, there's this aspect of people don't want to bother you. They're like, oh, Sean's a CEO. He's got bigger things to do. But they and I think people in my, on my team have started and have started to realize. Like, I, I use the expression, "What is it? Measure twice, cut once." I think yeah. this way. Yeah. That's something where you where you where you're going to save time if you if you if you have to cut it again. That's you know what we should have just measured it twice, which yes. which could mean have a conversation with me about it, make sure we're aligned and, and let's move forward. Yes. The old carpenter's expression, measure twice. So you don't have to, so you can only cut the board once, right? Sometimes you can't even cut the board twice. So you have no yeah. choice. You better measure right. That's a good one. That's, that's one that rings in my ears all the time as well. We, we, we definitely grew up uh, gen X, man. I don't know if, you know, these are great. Um, so shifting gears just a little bit, uh, Everyone these days, not everyone, but many these days are trying to, you know, again, build their career while for any reason, whether it's vanity, whether it's ego, whether it's uh, a side hustle, whether it's a pursuit of a main hustle, growing their social media presence. Oh my gosh. You know, posting on, on X, LinkedIn, Instagram, uh, you know, I mean like TikTok, I'm getting tired just saying it, how do you working work in the seams and cracks to get all that in there, man? How do you, how do you make that happen? How do you build? I know I like, what a dumb question. How do you build a, a, a one, one and a half million followership on, on Instagram? But, but seriously, the tactics of just keeping up with the rhythms, how, any, any hints there? I mean, first of all, you have to realize that and you have to understand that it's important. It's important not from the standpoint, like I had no desire to be famous. I had no desire to be in a TV show with my kids. Um, but I knew that this platform that I was growing could afford opportunities to do anything for myself yeah. or for other people, which, which people don't think about. It's not always about, oh, the more followers ha you have, the more product you're going to be able to sell. The yeah. better your, the bigger your influence, the more you can do for, um, you know, stand up to cancer and, and other, mm. and other organizations. And then I, what we realized early on is that once it becomes, once pr the production of content becomes work, then everybody starts to not want to do it. And inevitably the content isn't great. So we've been able to build, I, I really, real. I felt that, that, the production of content is is going to continue to be important and the the growth of a following is going to continue to be important no matter what you're doing whether you're a doctor lawyer um mm. power washer i mean you see all these guys on tiktok and yeah. they're 
creating incredible brands and the people that are just like, oh, you know, I, my daughter says she knows you from TikTok. I'm not on that thing or, or <laughs> I'm not big in social media. It's, you know, I'm not saying you can't be successful. I have friends that are, that are totally off the grid and are successful, but it is something that I think makes amplifies whatever you whatever you're trying to accomplish. So we put a team together of people that know what they're doing. So we have a, you know, we have a production team that doesn't work, that basically works for us on, on our, what we call our endorsement and entertainment side that kind of looks at all those things and, and posts, not necessarily X, um, is that what it's called now? <laughs> yeah, right. Formerly Twitter. known as Twitter. Formerly known uh, the as- symbol yeah. formerly known as Twitter. Um, <laughs> Yeah, I I, I kind of keep that to my that I hold that myself. So that's um, like you. Are, what's that? That's like you directly if you're yeah. gonna post. And okay. also, we do produce. Still, Dixie, Charlie, Heidi, myself, we all produce our own content. But between the endorsements and stuff, there are things that we we do have kind of a, a want a bird's eye view of what's happening. So yeah, I'll get it when we're at the trade show for the footwear the other day. I would just grab my phone and say. Hey, what's up, guys? It's Mark. I'm here at the Magic Trade Show. But then we also will get uh, our team will put together behind the scenes content and come up and ask us cool questions and make it. And, and we have a whole team of people that does that. And that's yeah. that's been a game changer for us. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's 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 a cool insight to peer into, obviously, mega influencers and the way they operate. Um, and it's a, so it's a combination of both like, you know, your thumbs and a quick story here or there, as well as team produced, very focused content. And you have to be, look, these are big properties worth a lot of money. Like once you clear a million on Instagram, that's can be very valuable. And I love what you said. Like, it's not just about, Oh, now I can monetize it and make a ton of money with endorse. Like for instance, one of the things I'm most proud of with this book I'm, I'm publishing let me save you 25 years is all net proceeds are going to uh, the future business leaders of America nonprofit, all of it. Cause like no one wants to see, you know, us, the founder of a company that's growing toward a billion making more money now by trying to sell me a book. Right. And so, but to your point, you know, good can be done by getting bigger. So do I want to sell thousands of books? Totally. I, of course, I love getting the story out there and obviously what I believe in concepts like this, but I think it's so cool that, you know, the more books we sell, the more money goes toward these kids that are going to be you and me someday, you know? Yeah. And, that, and that's what I tell my kids sometimes where, when it seems like they're in a hamster wheel and, and, you know, <laughs> I just, one of the things we've done is look, we knew that there's a great opportunity. It was an opportunity for us to generate revenue but that's that was a this that wasn't the biggest part of it this was more like hey you can put yourself in a situation to 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 really find what you're passionate about and what you love mm-hmm. to do and for, for me i've always tried to be involved in 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 things like whether it was the kids school or and i realize now with this platform i can do you know, we could do good and we, and we have, we did, you know, you know, we've done a lot of things that are public and we've done a lot of things that, that are behind the scenes. And, and I think we have an obligation to do those things and not yeah. just, you know, not just try to sell products to people. I think that's, yeah. you know, that's, that's part of, that's part of it, but I want that to be a smaller part of it. And I want to be able to, to do good in, in the world. That's awesome. That's super admirable. I, I feel like, um, listen, it's easy to just perceive it as another way to make money. Oh, now it's, you know, an apparel brand, who knows what, and, and, and look, there's nothing wrong with making money. This is a show about business, about entrepreneurship, about work ethic, all these things. Uh, at the same time though, you can do good without a platform, but you can't do the same kind of good. Like your ability to reach people now and convey a message, whatever that is, is, is way greater than it was a few years back before your platform was the size it is today. So, so you could have still been doing good. You could have still been donating money. Who knows what, whatever, showing up for service. 
but now you can do a different kind of good. And so, but you can't without the platform. So it's like the egg and the chicken. And, uh, I think that people don't need to, don't need to be on the platforms. They don't, they could choose to be off grid. I think that's admirable in its own way. But if, but if you can make it happen, if you can see the path and you have the skills and ability, and like you said, I think that a little bit of love for it. So it's not just, I think when it comes from an inauthentic place where it's look, man, if I can get to a million followers, I can monetize that or whatever it may be. I think that people smell authenticity. They just sniff it out. You know, who's the most authentic guy doing this that I know is Michael Rubin, who's a good buddy of mine. Hmm. And you know, he, he's one of the guys who is, is a billionaire that you look at like, man, he's doing it right. He's enjoying his life. He's, he's a family guy, but with stuff he's done with, with prison reform and the reform Alliance and, and helping Meek and, and, you know, doing things that, that I just look at him all the time. And, and it does, you got to know him because a lot of people say, Oh, they, they might say he's doing it because to, to, but it's in him. He is that giving guy. Like I've witnessed it mm-hmm. firsthand and what he's done for, for my family and, and strangers. And, and it's, I, you know, he called us early on during the pandemic and he started this thing called the all in challenge. And I think he first went to Meek and the second people he called was, were us. And it was amazing. It, you, I felt great at doing it and, He's, you know, he's one of my close friends and he is the best at combining being a, a serious business guy that you wouldn't want to mess with, but the the genuine philanthropy and 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 goodness that he he's the best. So, That's I don't know amazing. if you know him, but he's an awesome guy. No, I don't. I'd, I'd love to meet him. I uh I I know he, I think he's an investor, right, in your in in your new venture? Yes. I saw. That's really cool. Yes. Yeah. That's great. Well, con- and congratulations on that. And I think it just goes to show, you know, like you, you, you so the first Seanism in the book is uh, just do something. And of course, as a f- fellow entrepreneur, I'm, 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 I'm certain that resonates with you. Like you actually did stuff. <laughs> Your daughters actually did stuff. You know, it's not like it was just handed to you. You know, people can look at influencers and just, of course it looks glamorous and, and easy and fun. Cause you, if it doesn't look easy, if you're not making it look easy, then your content sucks. Like you need to make your content fun and easy to watch. Right. But making content's freaking hard, man. It's exhausting. It's a never ending. You know, it is a hamster wheel. And so I think uh, I have a lot of admiration for, but you, to your point, you got to have a little bit of love for it. And that's, and I think that that resonates back to what we're talking about today. Like part of the reason I was willing to spend pretty much my entire twenties and my entire thirties working in every single seam and crack, like into the late nights, long drives. I mean, I drew, I drove millions of miles pulling trailers, you know, across the country, doing all kinds of things, visiting stores, all the things that I did is because I had love for what I was doing. You know, it wasn't just like, so I could be like super rich someday. Yeah. And to your point, the money is an outcome. I think that's, I mean, not to put words in your mouth, but I feel like that's what you were getting at a minute ago, right? Like, yeah, guess what? Now you can do all kinds of things with your platform and leverage it in different ways and spin up brands. But you couldn't have done that without having built the platform, which took a lot of grit, you know, and your daughters as well. A lot of risk. I mean, people don't, um, you know, and, and people think it happened overnight, but there were steps that we took, um, early on and me taking me being look i'm a risk taker i definitely uh, i have friends who worked at the same company for 30 years and are killing it and are very successful but i definitely my kids saw me take risks started my own clothing brand in 2000 and and you know learned all the all, all things that i never thought i would know design production yeah. all those things and and you know I think at one point, Charlie came to me, both daughters were like, why don't we try to move to LA? And I was like, well, this could be a really (laughs) good teaching moment for for me to say, yeah, we have all this stuff on the East Coast, but let's get out of our comfort zone and do something that, you you know, and when we were able to do it because of my business, I had a showroom in New York City. Um, it was closed down because of the pandemic. So we came out here and we took, we took some, we took some risk and, and, uh, it, it definitely 
definitely worked out. Well, and, and as I've observed, for whatever reason, LA really is the hub. If you're going to be a mega influencer, they're all there. They're all interacting. They're all learning, you know, learning the tricks of working in the seams and cracks from each other. And, and obviously, you know, I have some other friends in that realm and it's been interesting to observe. So congratulations. Way to, way to take the risk, way to make the leave. I'm curious, do you observe your daughters working in those seams and cracks? You know, do you, do, are they, are, do you observe those behaviors where their, their work ethic um, is really reflected in their ability to get the things done and, and, and make the things happen in all the little seams and cracks of their own busy lives? I don't know as much as it as the, as it is seams and cracks as I would say that when you least expect it, your kids are paying attention, and I definitely see things in them that I'm like, wait, where did they get that from? And my wife will say, Heidi will say, they saw you doing that. So mm. I would say, you know, whether they look how to optimize it and really um, look in the seams and cracks. I don't know that they're there yet, but they're definitely are, are they're definitely have learned how to be entrepreneurs and 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 run their own businesses. And I'm really proud of it. Those are those moments as a dad that you're like where you think they're just not paying attention to you and they're not observing and 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 you're like, oh wow, maybe I did do something right right as a as a as a dad. So it's cool. Mm -hmm. Yeah. There's nothing more rewarding. I sometimes joke around like, you know, I'll get friends who want to go skiing or like, oh yeah, we're going to go with a bunch of dudes. We're going to go on a ski trip or we're going to go on a whatever trip. And that's cool. And like, there's nothing wrong with, you know, doing cool stuff. But you know what, if I had to choose like spending a day anywhere skiing with any one of my kids and watching them do it, it's so much more rewarding than like going really, really fast with my buddies yeah. Um, or something like that, you know, and so I, 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 uh, appreciate what you're saying. That's cool. You have that perspective. It's gotta be fun to watch your daughters have so much success, even as you, as, as you're all having success, it's gotta be a really fun ride. It is. It is. Yeah. Congratulations. It's cool. Um, all right. Well, uh, and, and, and real quick, any, any thoughts for people who aren't, you know, necessarily entrepreneurs, influencers, um, People work in their nine to five, people that are enjoying, uh, you know, not enjoying, not having the pressure of, of being an entrepreneur, but are business minded people that are, that are inside of an organization. Any, any thoughts on how people like that can apply the idea of working in the seams and cracks to their professional lives, to get ahead, to, to, you know, be a, become a leader, advance in their careers, um, you have a lot of people that have worked for you over the years in very various capacities. Any thoughts on that? I, I mean, I think finding a company that understands that, uh, I tell everybody all the time, I think it's a new age, right? When we were, when, when 20 years ago it was the person that, oh my God, I remember my, my friend working for a public accounting firm and him putting in 15, 16 hours. And, and I'm more about results. And if you're, mm -hmm. I do think there's something to be said for people to be in the office and we have, uh, we, we do let people work from home, but I do like the culture it builds when people come in the office, but I'm, I just sit there and I say, if, and I've never used the expression, but work in the seams and cracks, if you could accomplish what you're supposed to accomplish working, you know, six hours a day, I, I was in sales. So I'm used to hitting my number, whether we have to, whether I put an hour in or, or eight hours in or 12 hours in, as long as I exceed my number, that's it. I would use the same, I use the same philosophy here. Like I don't expect people to work 15 hour days and to be, yeah. you know, and, and it's just not, and I almost frown upon it. I'm like, look, if you don't have a personal life and you're not doing the things you love, then you're not going to, I'd rather get six hours a day of five hours a day of someone coming in with a smile, enjoying themselves, kicking butt for five hours, than them, than me saying, wow, you're leaving already. Like, I don't care about that. I look at the results and I think I would say to someone, find a company and a, and, and a boss that kind of shares that philosophy that yeah. lets you live your, 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 your personal life. And I, I love that, that that's, 
changed. And I don't think if you do, I think if you do it right, it's not going to affect productivity. I think people, just because you're sitting at a desk for 12 hours doesn't mean you're productive. So find ways to be more productive and find a company that, that looks at that and goes, wow, great job. And doesn't look to, you know, squeeze you for every ounce of, of work. Cause I think you're not, I think it's going to burn, it burns people out in the long run. Yeah. I think that the work from home phenomenon uh, or work remote phenomenon that's really emerged since COVID is really, I hope healthy for the country, you know, more people just being around more, around their kids more, around home more, let, spending less time commuting in a car or train or who knows what. Um, generally, you know, clearly there's there are upsides to also having FaceTime and being real people and learning how to interact with you real human beings. Yeah. I think some, some balance will emerge uh, and I think those movements are good. I believe that, um, and I think it's also where you're at with your career. You know, there, there, there are, t- there have been times in my life where I, I mean, I would go sometimes th- two and three days without sleeping. I just had so much to do, so much to bang through opening showroom location, who knows what, I'm not even joking, man, Yeah, just brutal. And then there are times in our lives that uh, become a little more open and then it ebbs and flows. And I think we have to embrace that, you know, if we're early in our career and we really want to get ahead then work in every semen crack, man, whether it's yeah. for your own gig or whether it's, you know, just in a really great career that you want to grow and you want to advance. Like, I think what happened to ambition? I think that's okay. It doesn't mean it has to go on forever either. Yep. But I think sometimes it can take years. And I think sometimes it's okay to buckle in and go for it, you know, make some kind of advancement, whether, whether you're an entrepreneur or whether you're an employee, you know, I think both are great. My company wouldn't exist if everyone was an entrepreneur, yeah. like, right? And so I don't think everyone should be one. I think it's too celebrated. I think that, you know, there's a lot of merit in, in finding, like you said, I love that, a company that, or an organization that you can align with, that for whatever reason, you know, you, you like the content, you like what they're doing, you like their product, you like their, their philosophy, hopefully, or you just like the way that they're managed. Yeah. And then, like, be part of that. I think that there's nothing wrong with that. Yeah, I, I think, you know, it's hard to look. I look back on those times where I did what you did. I mean, I remember not having starting in design and not having a, a, the right Mac computer and the right Adobe software and going to Kinko's and and sp- staying up till five, six in the morning and coming back and showing Heidi my new catalog that I learned how to create and just balancing that out with what I missed. And, and when you're talking about the seams and cracks, I probably, if I knew what I knew now, I probably would have freed up a lot of time <laughs> to spend, you, you know, more, more time with, with my family. And we did, I did, I was cognizant of it back then, but I do look back now at like, dude, those times where you're, where Dixie was four and five mm-hmm. and, 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 uh, you know, how, how could have I balanced the work better to spend more, more time with them? And maybe it's just my own thing, where, where, when I talk with Heidi, she's like, no, you were there all, you were there mm-hmm. every weekend and, and around a lot. But, um, you know, I, I, I do like this new way where people are working, where they are putting themselves first. I mean, that's, you know, yeah. you, you, Europeans have done that for the longest time and Americans have been just all about working and working, working. And I think it just needs to be, I think productivity will not, you won't sacrifice productivity and I think that's what everyone's really scared about work from home and unlimited, va- unlimited vacation time. And, and, mm-hmm. and it's, it's, it's a tough balance. Um, but I, I think it's important to have people that walk in here and are actually happy to be here. I, I, w- I wouldn't feel good yeah. about mm-hmm. myself knowing that this is just a job. But when people like, I don't see a lot of people saying, seeing, well, first of all, cause it, we don't, it's you're allowed to work from home on on Fridays, but the people that are like, thank God it's Friday or live in the dream. I don't like I, I think that's that's a reflection on me. If people are like saying I'm living the dream kind of facetiously and joking around being like that, that's right. on me, man. I got to create a better environment. So people love to come in so here. They and, are living the dream. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. No, I love that. I love that accountability. That's a great perspective. And I think uh, you, you, as I know, you know, you can play in the seams and cracks as well. You know, like there's so many ways to roll with a very heavy workload and still 
you know, make time. Like I make myself get up at the crack of dawn while it's still dark so I can go get my dirt biking in. I'm a huge off-road or dirt biker, huge surfer when I'm out in California. You can play in the seams and cracks too. And you can create those seams and cracks if you just have even the littlest bit of discipline, a little bit of drive. You know, there's a lot of time in the day. Dirt bike, motorcycles or mountain bikes? Motorcycles and mountain bike, all of it. I'm really? into all of it, man. That's I'm into that too. So we started. If we, if you're out in Southern Utah, you you've got to come roll through St. George. St. George is like the mecca for all this stuff. Have you bought an electric dirt bike yet? Not yet. I, is it on the? I, I've I've seen some of these new ones that are out. I'm like, are you you ride dirt? I, I don't ride dirt motorcycles. I did BMX and mountain biking. I, oh, I cool. raced BMX as a kid. Dixie did also. So, but I, I keep seeing them on YouTube. So I, I might pick yeah. up one of those little electric Surons. Well, if you ever want to do any of that and you're in, you know, Red Rock country, Southern Utah, I, uh, hit me up. I, I would love it, man. Thank you, brother. So real, so wrap up, um, Mark, one piece of advice you'd give yourself or any young person starting out, you know, whatever, that may help them save 25 years or some chunk thereof? For my personality, again, I was definitely like, do it yourself, do it yourself. And and what happens is you just, you waste time doing, trying to figure out, like it served me great. I know how to open up Illustrator. I know how to, to, mm. to do all kinds of things. But the time cool. that it took me to do that, I probably would have hired an expert. And if you can't hire somebody, barter with someone. I mean, I know I'm not the first person to say that, but there are people out there that don't always try to do, to, to do it yourself and, and, and partner with, with, you know, my first partner in my first business was a high school friend who was a CPA he worked in public accounting. He was his, he, he worked in private accounting and he was a perfect guy because I was the sales and marketer and he was the person to make sure that the bills were paid and there was money in the bank and all those things. So delegate um, and, and bring people on to your team that, that have a skill set that you don't, that you don't have. And if you can't afford them, barter with them. And then the other thing I would, I would suggest is ask people who've done it for help. I think that's, I used to be super intimidated mm -hmm. to go up to my friend's parents and, and ask people. And yeah, it might not be easy to get a hold of me and my, my inbox of people asking for help, but I do answer a lot. And, yeah. you know, there is a, one of our interns that, went to the same college they went to university of connecticut came up to me at a basketball game and had a great mm -hmm. conversation with me and we hired him as an intern and i've given cool. him recommendations and and those are the things i think people i was so oh my god that person would never talk to me uh they're so successful but like a guy like me i have what am i going to do with all this information in my head if i can't i want to share it and i want i want to help so those are the two things i would suggest Brilliant advice. In fact, I watched a, a video of Steve Jobs yesterday, the late Steve Jobs giving similar advice. You know, he, he shares the story of when he was like, I don't know, 14 and he called up uh, um, Hewlett to, to get some spare parts because he happened to live in the neighborhood and just asked him. The guy answered his phone. And I, I, I answered DMs uh, from customers and from uh, strangers all day, every day. I'm, I'm, and, and employees as well. You know, I'm connected with people. So I think, uh, but you got to be bold enough to reach out and to ask the questions. I think that's brilliant advice, Mark. Definitely on point. Um, really appreciate your time. Anything you want to plug or leave with people? Ways to find you? What's your latest project? Anything you want to put out there? No, I mean, I just we're. You can follow me at uh, Mark Demilio at Mark Demilio um, and. Just happy to be here, enjoying life and, and realizing that, you know, life is a gift and and I try not to sweat the small things and I try to instill in my kids like this is a life is incredible. And as long as you're waking up every morning and you can breathe and, and uh, you know, th things will work out. So, yeah, look, man, I love your attitude, your general point of view. I learned a lot even from some of your podcasts that I've listened to. And it's been great chatting with you today. Uh, thanks for the time. Thanks, Sean. Appreciate you, man. 
You can follow Mark as I do on X or Instagram at M-A-R-C-D-A-M-E-L-I-O. And uh, there is, of course, the D'Amelio show exclusively on Hulu. He has endless content all over YouTube where he continues to be very open and transparent about himself, his take on business secrets to his success, and everything regarding the D'Amelio family. We're so grateful to get your insights today working in the seams and cracks. We are so grateful uh, for all of your time. And hopefully you listeners can save a chunk of your 25-year journey thanks to some of the insights from this convo. Don't forget to like this podcast, please. Uh, Subscribe to it and do share it out on social media to help others hopefully save a chunk off of their 25-year journey because you're just that good of a friend. Thank you to this bastion of new school businessmen, the dawn of celebrity influencer daughters, the scion of social media, no joke, Mr. Mark D'Amelio. This was amazing. Thank you, Sean. Appreciate it, man. 